For the next half hour, we'll get to know the story of Pete Rose and meet some of the people who helped shape his life. It's the story of a winner. Pete Rose, Countdown to History. Down to history. The Pete Rose story. In baseball, they said some records would never be broken. No one would ever surpass Babe Ruth's home run mark. But Hank Aaron did it and added 40 more. The same was said about Walter Johnson's strikeout total. But the big train was overtaken in recent years by Nolan Ryan, who first topped Johnson. Then came Steve Carlton. And soon thereafter, Gaylord Perry, with others sure to follow. Hi, Pete. Hey, John, how you doing? Nice, nice to see you again. Thank you. Pete, you were born right here in Cincinnati, and from what I understand, you learned to play sports, well, really right at home. Well, uh, when I was a kid, I, I grew up watching the Cincinnati Reds at Crosley Field. As a matter of fact, I was born about two miles from Crosley Field. We lived about seven miles from Crosley Field and played all my little league baseball right down at the Bullface Park, which is down on River Road, just a couple miles from Crosley Field. And, like a lot of other good players uh, that have made the big leagues uh, from Cincinnati, uh, I just followed suit. Well, you had a father that was very involved in sports, kind of a legend around this area because he played really semi-pro football and baseball. Well, there's no question that uh, the biggest influence on my life was my father, uh, especially my sports life, because of him exposing me uh, to the right way to play the game uh, uh, as far as wanting to win, uh, what, what it takes to win just by watching him, how important winning is, which I think is, is, is everything. Is there anyone that you modeled your career after? Was you have an idol, somebody that you emulated? No, not really. Um, I think everybody sort of thinks that Enos Slaughter because of the way you slide and the way you hustle. No, that, that story uh, goes back to one day we were watching a baseball game at home on our TV set, which was about seven inches in diameter. Uh, and the, the Cardinals were playing, and Enos Slaughter got a, I was about nine, ten years old, and, and the Card Enos Slaughter got a base on balls, and he just sprinted to first. And my father said, now that's the way to approach the game. Uh, you know, just, it doesn't take any effort to run down the first base. And, and I started doing it at that time, which was about nine years old. And uh, uh, that, that's about the only thing I did that, that Enos Slaughter did. Were you switch hitting by that time? At nine years old, and the reason I become a switch hitter, John, because the uncle who signed me eventually, uh, was a professional baseball player, and he didn't have his, he didn't enjoy his uh, biggest success until about the age 30 when he decided to be a switch hitter in the minor leagues. And, and uh, they could see some potential as far as me being a switch hitter. I can honestly say that uh, from the first time I played organized baseball, I, I became a switch hitter. Real competition for Rose began at Western Hills High School. But when Pete first took the field, Coach Paul Pappy Knorr wasn't overwhelmed. He was a little guy, an average fielder and, uh, and uh, a fair batter, he, uh, and very aggressive, and uh, willing to work, and that, 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 that's Pete. He's probably put more guys in the Billies than any other coach in the history of this country. Uh, uh, there's been 11 make the Billies from Western Hills, and he put 10 of us in the big leagues. And I think what Pappy learned is, John, is uh, the right way to play the game. He was a fundamentally sound coach, and he taught his players the fundamentals of baseball, uh, the do's and don'ts, so to speak. And uh, because of that, he's been very successful. Pete has, has two great things going for him. One, a great incentive was his dad. His dad played uh, Sunday football until he was 42 years old. And Pete just patterned after his dad. And his dad urged him and kept him moving. And then Pete's own desire. Pete's a self-made fellow. Put it in your book. You still had a tough time getting signed. Your uncle actually was a scout for the Reds and had something to do with it. Well, it wasn't that I couldn't play, John. My problem was that I was too small. Uh, I was always a catcher like you was, not as good as you when I was a kid. And when I got to be a, a, a sophomore in high school, I weighed about 140 pounds, and I was too small to be a catcher, so they put me at second base. And don't ask me why, but everybody in my family matured physically late. And uh, some families are like that. And 
And uh, my uncle convinced the Reds that I would be a solid 190, 195 pounder someday, which I uh, have become since then. You went to Geneva. You took over second base from a guy who was playing there, Tony Perez. When I first signed that contract, John, I graduated from high school on a Friday, uh, and that was a chore, me graduating from high school. It took five years, but I, I got an extra year, so I learned a little bit more than most red guys. Shirt. Yeah, they, I redshirted my sophomore year. <laughs> That's before they even had red shirts. And uh, when I signed a contract, I graduated on Friday, went to Crosby Field on a Saturday morning, and signed a contract, uh, got a bonus that I cashed at the nearest drugstore. Uh, they gave me the next day off, and uh, I left the following Monday to go to Geneva, New York. When I arrived there, Tony Perez was the second baseman on that ball club. And I might add, he was about two and a half months out of Cuba. Uh, he just escaped from Cuba, and he had his spring training, and he was the second baseman at that time. That's 1960, June of 1960. And uh, I went to second base, they moved him to third base. 1963. Now, that was the year the countdown began. About three games. Three games in the season. I went over the first two games. And lo and behold, the first hit I got was a triple down the left field line. I remember the first game I played in, um, I, was, I wasn't nervous at all. Here's the, here's the, uh, the circumstances. Uh, it was about 20 minutes before game time. The, the opposing pitcher was Earl Francis. And I remember right about 20 minutes before game time, uh, someone from the Enquirer wanted to get a picture of my father and my mother and my brother. And I guess when they came down by the dugout, it sort of woke me up as far as where I was at. You know, hey, this is reality. I'm at, I'm at uh, Crosley Field and it's opening day. Uh, for Cincinnati Reds, which in those days was a big thing. And I think when those family members came down and got the picture taken, I started slapping myself in the face as far as where I was at. And I got a little bit nervous, and the first time at bat I went up there and uh, I didn't swing at a ball. He walked me on four straight pitches. In 1963, Pete Rose was named Rookie of the Year. And it soon seemed that he was cranking out 200 hits a season every season. As he passed the 1,000 and 2,000 marks, the comparisons began. Comparisons to Ty Cobb, said to be the greatest hitter of all time. The countdown to history was on its way. One and one to the waiting Jim Hickman. And right into the stretch. Looking back and throws up the middle. Rose is on his way around. Picked up by Otis. Rose is coming to the plate. Throws the throw. He's in. It's all over. The National League win. Rose barreled into Ray Fossey. Well, the time was an extra inning ball game. Uh, it was about the first month that the riverfront was open. There was 50-some thousand people there, and I felt, being from Cincinnati, I knew half the people in the stadium. And uh, Ray Fossey was the catcher, and I might add that he was at my house the night before the game to about 3 o'clock in the morning, and the reason he was at my house, a good friend of mine uh, from the Cleveland who made the All-Star team was Sam McDowell. And... Uh, Fossey was his catcher, and he made the all-star team, too. And at that time, Fossey was going to be the next Johnny Bench. And he come along, he come along to dinner uh, with, uh, with uh, McDowell only because he wanted to talk about you all night. It's God's honest truth. He wanted to know everything about Johnny Bench that I could tell him. And they stayed in my house till about 3 o'clock in the morning. And if you see the replay on that play, I did start to slide but he left me no recourse because there was no place to slide. Because if I slide, I'm not going to make the plate, and there's no sense in ever sliding into a bag if you can't get the bag. Ty Cobb had that kind of uh, reputation of going all out. What do you know about Ty Cobb? I know pretty much about him. Uh, and, you know, some of it's hearsay, uh, as what happens uh, once a guy's passed away. And Ty Cobb died in 1961. Uh, but from everything I've gathered about Ty Cobb, John, I think the only similarities we have is we both loved to hit, and we both hated to lose, and we both loved our father. If there's anything that you could ask Ty Cobb, would you ask him anything in particular? Well, um, yeah, I think, I, I think I'd like to know uh, his philosophies on hitting, because anybody that can win uh, 12 out of 13 batting championships, he probably hated the guy who won the 13th. Uh, and anybody can have a 367 lifetime. Just think about that. I mean, you were the ball player in the, in the Hall of Fame. Just think about a guy having a 367 lifetime batting average for 24 years. Detroit's Ty Cobb was a remarkably driven man. Cobb didn't play the game. He attacked it, batting over 323 seasons. Using the split hand grip to establish records in batting, hits, runs, and stolen bases. Despite all the success, Cobb could never rest. He was often at odds with opponents and teammates alike, becoming known as one of the roughest men ever to play the game. Spending six years as a Tigers player-manager, 
Cobb finished his career at the age of 41, batting 323 in his final season. When it comes to dedication, Pete Rose stands with Cobb. In the 73 playoffs against the Mets, Rose displayed his own thorny style when he slammed in the shortstop Bud Harrelson on a double play. As fights go, it wasn't much, but it helped make both men famous. Uh, that was just a situation where you had two aggressive players uh, playing on national TV in a big game, uh, a playoff game. And I, how many times have you broken up a double play like that? And all of a sudden you just get into a little scuffle at, at second base and it ends up uh, being a big thing all over the country because it's on national TV. Plus, I was a very aggressive person anyway, and I, d I just think that people in this country, uh, uh, they don't always like aggressive people, confident people. Uh, they call them arrogant and, and, and cocky. I don't. I call them confident. Confident was the key word in Cincinnati throughout the 1970s as the Big Red Machine produced one dominant team after another. Six division winners, four pennants, and back-to-back -back World Series titles in 75 and 76. As the Reds reveled in the glory of their days. I always looked at my role as a member of the Big Red Machine uh, was a table setter. Uh, I was the guy who was supposed to get on base 300 times a year for you and Perez and, and of course, Morgan. Uh, he was a table setter, too, and uh, I knew what my job was. Uh, I knew what my capabilities wa were, and I tried to stay with them myself. Uh, and I think everyone on the ball club knew what they could do, and we just went out and did it on a daily, consistent basis. We had more good players than the other team in the league, and that's why we excelled, and that's why we... Uh, dominated uh, in the 70s. It was very easy to pick the team of the decade in the 70s. It won't be as easy to pick the team in, in the 80s, obviously, as it was just to write R-E-D-S in the 70s. Well, if you weren't at the time, you soon became a national celebrity, chasing Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. The media didn't really pick up on it until I got 31, and that was because uh, Willie Davis had had the highest one up to that time in many, many years at 31. And once I surpassed that, then that's when the national media really started picking up on it. Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hit streak loomed as one of baseball's greatest achievements. And as Rose drew even with Wee Willie Keeler's 44, his confidence seemed to grow with a constant media attention. But finally in Atlanta, it's the ninth inning. Gene Garber's pitching, and Rose is hitless. His streak in danger. Now the 2-2. Two -two. Put on this. Rose's streak is broken. The break is getting another standing ovation. I'm so tight with Joe DiMaggio. I would really like to, you know, just see what would happen if I got up in the 50s. And 44 is not bad, I guess. 1978, you already had 3,000 hits. Sparky was fired, and you were on your way to Philadelphia. I wanted to stay in Cincinnati. And what I was looking for then, uh, because of what I was used to, was a winning team. Uh, the team that had come very close. And uh, the Phillies won the pennant. And, or they won the division in 76, 77, 78, but they never reached the World Series, and I thought that I could add that little spark uh, to the Phillies. With his incredible knack of being in the right place at the right time, Rose helped lead the Phillies to the 1980 World Series title, proving that a Rose with any other name would still be Pete. As the success continued, so did the countdown. Stan the Man was straight ahead. Stan the Man Musial enjoyed 22 years with the St. Louis Cardinals, establishing himself as the National League's all-time hit leader. But in 1981, Rose passed the Musial milestone. There's a youngster. That's Petey Jr. The strike one, Mr. Rose. Bounce through the hole, ball in. was real rewarding to me because I've always been a, a National Leaguer and I've always been a National League fan. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, you know, Cobb still had the, the, the record uh, uh, in, in Major League Baseball, 41-91, and even Aaron was still ahead of me then because he went to the American League for a couple years and got 3,700 and some hits. So uh, that was something that was going to fall the next year. 
Well, now your fame was in full gear because right after that game, I believe President Reagan called. Yeah, he had a hard time getting through, too. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Rose, one moment, please. <laughs> Hello? One moment, sir. Mr. Rose, one moment, please. Okay. <laughs> I waited 19 years. I can wait another minute. Who's speaking, please? Pete Rose. One moment, sir. Good thing you're in a missile on the way. <laughs> I kept picking up, and this guy kept saying, Mr. Reagan's on the line. And I said, hello. And uh, he said, hi, this is Ronald Reagan. I said, hi, how you doing? And everybody got a big kick out of it. What the hell was I supposed to say? Hello. Hello. Pete Rose? Yes, sir. Well, this, this is Ronald Reagan. How you doing? Well, <laughs> he's, he's a great uh, sports fan, and it was, it was nice for him to take time to call me, and uh, I appreciated that. Okay, well, nice talking to you. Congratulations again. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> After Philadelphia in 1984, Rose was on the road to Montreal. It was there that the countdown reached 4,000 hits. Soon thereafter, Rose had a conversation with Red's general manager, Bob Housen. Mr. Uh, Hausen started talking uh, about me coming back as, uh, as Hausen wanted as a manager, not as a player. And about a week went by, and uh, Mr. Katz told me to give uh, Mr. Hausen a call from Montreal to across the river in Kentucky. And that was my first mistake, because I called him, uh, I didn't call him collect, and I talked for about two and a half hours on the phone. And I had to more or less convince Mr. Hausen that, uh, that I could still hit and be a player manager. And once I made it known to him that I didn't want to play every inning of every game of every day, he started thinking about it. And in the matter of four or five more days, I was back as a Cincinnati manager. Cincinnati gladly welcomed the return of its favorite son. Rose's repeat performance now included the manager's role. And it was a part he was ready to play. Uh, Pete Rose is Cincinnati. I, and he, uh... I know the fans love him. Uh, everybody that I've talked to you know, around Cincinnati is so glad he's back, and he just uh, he just brings winning back to back to Cincinnati. I think we're a lot better team with him. Gary, you, you know this? He's got a real good. He's got a bulk move to first, and he's real quick. I mean, he's one seven to home, but he's real. He picks a lot of guys off first. I, everybody thinks he bulks, but they don't ever call it. So be careful over there. That's just like being a manager. I've always thought that. Uh, if you've got a manager, maybe you don't like your manager. But if you respect him, you're going to play hard for him. Well, he's got both of that. He's got respect, and they like him, too. That's why I think he'd be a great manager. And he leads by example. And he's got a high leg kick, but he goes to home in 1.7. You know, it might appear that he's slow, but he's not. I mean, according to the, yeah. you know, the figures. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, if he's playing, they're not going to do that. If he breaks off, if he breaks get off, you get a jump. Yeah. You get a jump, a bunch of the third. Anytime they're going to give you something, take it. If I were to describe Pete as a manager, if you wanted to say player's manager because he has the respect of the players, he has the interest of the players at heart because he is still a player. Uh, as far as how he handles the game, I think he's a throwback to the managers in the early 60s. Uh, from a pitching standpoint, the starter stayed in the ball game till it was tie or till he gave up the lead run. You sure you all right? Fine. I'll let you know. <laughs> You're going to be out there. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I said, how do you feel? He said, I'll let you know. I said, how are you going to let me know? You're going to be out there. What will be the end for Pete Rose? Will 4,192, will you continue to play? Hopefully, I will do a good enough job this year where Marge Schott will want me back as her manager in 1986. Hopefully, I will do a good enough job as a hitter, as a player, uh, that the Reds will want me back as a player in 1986. I know the manager will want me back next year. Uh, I don't know if the owner will. I have to take the opportunity to repay baseball if everything is done for me. And if being a manager is, is what it's going to take, uh, you know, I'd like to be like uh, Walter Olson. I'd, I'd love to be a manager for 20 years, 21-year contracts. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, because if I don't do a good enough job, I don't want to be paid. I might as well work down there because if I didn't play or if I didn't manage, I'd be going down there every night anyway. Is Pete Rose a boy playing a man's game? That's all it is. That's all we all are. We're all kids playing a grown-ups game, or grown-ups playing a kid's game. And as long as you can continue to play with the enthusiasm of a kid, there's no reason why you should get old. There's an old saying. In order to play baseball, you've got to be a man with a lot of little boy in you. If any player in baseball today best combines man and boy, it's Pete Rose. After 23 years of hustling and scraping for everything, 
Pete Rose is in the final stages of his countdown as he becomes baseball's all-time hit leader. Here's to the greats of the past, Cobb, Ruth, and Johnson. But let's hear it for Pete Rose, one of the greatest ever to play the game and one who made all those boyhood dreams come true. I think Pete Rose, the best way he's describing him is that he thinks he's 18 years old. He's always been a hard worker. I think that's the one thing that has never changed in Pete Rose. Just seeing Pete, that sticks out. The hustle, the, the idea of coming to the ballpark, ready to play, and, and, and being a winner. He's my friend, and uh, uh, he's been my teammate for a lot of years. And um, I really, I, 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 I love the man. I really do.